lecture of the day and the third of Julian Sonner about developments on quantum field theory and chaos. Please. Okay. So the third lecture I want to uh, talk about um, the ergodic phase of quantum gravity. Um, and let me recap a couple of points. So, first of all, um, we've already argued that this ergodic phase, which I, which I defined um, to be the phase where a random matrix type description starts being useful and appropriate, um, is actually um, a very sensitive probe to the structure of the microstates of the underlying theory. And that, of course, uh, in that case, gravity is no exception, and in particular, it has non-perturbative sensitivity to the microstates. Um, then um, I've argued that there's this sort of symmetry-breaking story, which, um, for reasons I didn't delve into a lot, but uh, um, Alex and I like to refer to this as causal symmetry-breaking because it is intimately tied to the causal structure of the theory, and that had to do with what I had been already asked about why, for example, we have this interesting analytic continuation in the advanced and retarded sector at the same time. Um, and so I would like to say that this causal symmetry breaking is another way abstractly of defining the ergodic phase. And in concrete terms, for example, via this flavor nonlinear sigma model. Um, but there is, um, the question still remains um, in some sense, what is special about gravity in this story? And uh, maybe we can discuss this uh, tomorrow, or if there is time even today. So um, let me therefore talk about the example right now um, of two-dimensional JT gravity, Rakeev's Teitelbaum gravity. So um, this is a low dimensional model, obviously it's in two dimensions, um, where you have, um, you know, it's, let, let's call it a yeah, low dimensional, low D model, uh, where um, this, the ergodic behavior can be established explicitly. So um, to define it, um, uh, it's quite useful to write down the action. I just realized that I should probably call it I because I will later also in, uh, um, introduce some object that I will call SJT, which will be the spectral curve. So let's call the action I. So this is a two-dimensional theory of gravity, and in two dimensions, the Einstein-Hilbert term itself is topological, in fact, integrates to the Euler number, chi of m. And it's customary in the setting to call the coupling constant to the Euler number S0. So that's really just a choice of name, but the name comes from the fact that um, there, is a, there is a certain connection to uh, this SYK class of models uh, that have behavior at the lower end of their spectrum that includes JT gravity as a mode, and there this coupling is really uh, identified with the degeneracy of the ground state um, of, of SYK. So this is the residual ground state entropy there, but it's, here is just a symbol. We could just call it any coupling, uh, lambda, for example, if we prefer that. But then um, you actually have the following model. You have an integral over these two-dimensional metrics, two-dimensional two manifolds, and instead of writing down the naive Einstein-Hilbert term, which gave me the Euler density, we introduce this field phi, a dilaton, which multiplies r plus two. Um, and then you have a bunch of boundary terms. So for example, you have something like the Gibbons, Hawking, York boundary term, um, and you will have some um, holographic renormalization terms. 
So those boundary terms, they um, are important when you talk about boundary conditions. And for the first half, I will choose boundary terms such that I can impose Dirichlet uh, boundary conditions. So, um, right, so, and here I could say that this is um, Einstein-Hilbert term, and it gives rise to the Euler density. Okay, and there's this old mathematical joke that in three dimensions, gravity has no degrees of freedom, so in two dimensions it has minus one degrees of freedom, so you have to add one more degree of freedom to make this theory trivi trivial again. Okay, so that's why you want to have this field phi here. So, um, um, what I want to do is, um, I want to compute the spectral form factor in this theory. Um, and I should say that uh, part of what I'm talking about today will rely, will be in, also in the spirit of a review of um, seminal work that is due to the Stanford group. So in this case, Saad, Schenker, and Stanford, conveniently all working in Stanford, and um, of Maria Mirzokhani, and actually also Ena and Oranta, who are more or less mathematical people who actually established um, essentially that story, but from a mathematical perspective previously, okay? I, I will not actually use, by the way, the point of view of these authors, but I might make some reference to it in words. So we want to compute the spectral form factor of this theory. Um, and um, as uh, I had already said, actually, in this setting, it's, it's quite natural uh, to compute uh, things like partition functions where you fix the inverse temperature. Fixing the inverse temperature is precisely fixing the length of the boundary circle. And that will be what these boundary conditions that we'll choose will achieve. So z of beta is the thermal trace e to the minus beta h of the system. And then I can reconstruct the um, spectral density rho of e basically via inverse Laplace transform um, of z of beta. Okay. So, um, d beta. Um, right, so, um, so let's talk about the path integral for JT gravity. And as I said, even though uh, I think the mathematical foundations really were laid by, by the mathematicians. I am following the treatment of, uh, in the seminal paper by SSS. So, um, well, what one would write here is something like uh, the integral over phi and metric okay, of E to the minus I JT, um, where, um, well, this is, I guess, an equation I want to refer to again, um, where this is a, a two-dimensional gravitational theory, and in fact, one, one thing that is nice to note uh, is that actually, as such, being a two-dimensional theory of gravity, um, also, the string world sheet happens to be two-dimensional, and you can actually treat uh, the, this kind of object, you can treat it in analogy, uh, can be treated to 
to, uh, to the way that we usually deal with um, the string world sheet. Uh, it's also not, not really a perspective that I'm going to emphasize a lot, but um, I'm going to make comments maybe here and there uh, where, where it is appropriate. So, okay, so uh, the other thing is, of course, uh, so Z of beta, right? So um, basically we compute Z of beta and other quantities with the same boundary conditions, which basically means that for now we study the canonical ensemble of this theory. So um, that corresponds, as I was saying, to the hysterically boundary conditions. So what we say is that um, let us, so, so you remember also from the previous lecture now, these ideas, uh, these pictures of time slices basically disks with a circle boundary. So let us think about disk with a circle boundary and let us parameterize the distance from the boundary as epsilon. So this is like very large radius in the uh, notation that, the, that the Chris was using. Okay, but um, epsilon small meaning we're closer and closer to the boundary. And um, what we want to say is that phi at this boundary which we regulate with epsilon is fixed which means that we call it something like phi boundary and we have to multiply it by one over epsilon squared. Um, uh, no, one over epsilon. While um, we also fix the metric, which is like, let's call the boundary time coordinate GUU, and this we fix to also a constant here, it's one over epsilon squared. And what this means is that the, it fixes the boundary length to be, um, fixes the, boundary length uh, to be uh, beta over epsilon squared, which is the appropriate thing to fix it to in the canonical ensemble. But it only fixes the length. Um, we haven't said anything about the shape of the boundary curve. So in fact, it allows for uh, an arbitrary shape of this boundary curve, um, which uh, in this business, people call, uh, it allows for a, a wiggly boundary. So in actual fact, we cut out some disc-shaped region, but we don't really specify the shape. So this thing is uh, called a wiggly boundary. Okay. And if you want, of course, what we have is we still have topologically a circle. It's just we haven't, we haven't fixed its shape. And so you can actually define such curves in terms of circle diffeomorphisms. And the theory of circle diffeomorphisms uh, via its connection to the Vera Sorokoa joint orbits is actually sort of the mathematically correct way to think about really defining what's going on with this boundary wiggle contribution to the path integral. Um, but we can be more pedestrian. Um, we can actually just say um, when you uh, integrate what remains here on the disk is the degrees of freedom of the wiggly boundary so we just need to figure out what is the action cost of the wiggly degrees of freedom and then integrate over them and that's by the way the analogy although I'm, I'm now realizing it's maybe not the best possible analogy but uh, over these boundary gravitons in ADS3 so, um, however, okay, this, this, is, this, this is what we have here. Um, um, and maybe the other thing I wanted to say is that um, wiggly boundary, so you see this, this, this GHY boundary term roughly is something like uh, boundary metric times phi at the boundary times the extrinsic curvature of the boundary minus one, where uh, the minus one is a holographic renormalization type term. This is what we would call the gibbons hawking york boundary term. And we're not fixing, so that's another way of saying wiggly boundary, we're not fixing K, so the extrinsic curvature in particular need not vanish, so it need not be a geodesic curve. So basically I'm just restating that you can allow these wiggly boundaries and we have to integrate over them. So um, what you do is that, um, um, 
we need to integrate over the over the wiggles and um, it's actually a simple case of uh, putting in those boundary conditions, putting in some parameterization for an arbitrary wiggly curve and plugging it into this formula. And what pops out is this, this famous Schwarzian action. So you need to integrate over the wiggles with the Schwarzian action. So in other words, it costs you a little bit to wiggle the boundary, but in a nice way. Um, and so this integral can be done. And um, well, I will cite some results. Uh, I, will, I, will, I will give you some results in a little bit. Okay. Now, very good. So um, however, um, we also have something like this defy integral here. And the defy integral just gives you a constraint, namely that r says so like a delta function of r plus 2. So in the end, you can focus on hyperbolic manifolds. Um, and you just need to somehow integrate over the moduli space of the hyperbolic manifold and over the remaining boundary wiggles. And so, um, so let's say the phi integral imposes uh, delta of r plus 2. Um, and so, i.e., it remains to integrate over hyperbolic metrics. And so the result will be something like the partition function, oh, um, and um, I, don't, I, I don't know why I neglected to say this. So, for example, here, what we have is one boundary. One circle means one boundary. But in general, we may consider the case where the boundary is actually a disjoint union of circles. So, S circle 1, union 2, union Sn. So, you have some manifold which has you know, all these uh, circular, circular boundaries, n of them, each boundary has some wiggles, and then we need to glue them together and integrate over the remaining moduli space. So then you get an expression of the form z of beta 1 up to beta n, where each of these boundaries has some fixed length. Okay. Um, and this is actually going to be uh, a, a, a sum over the genus of coupling constant lambda to the um, Euler number, which we have seen, um, of something like z g comma n, where g is the genus g contribution with n boundaries um, to this partition function. So chi, the Euler number is the usual um, 2 minus 2g minus n, where g is the uh, genus, n is the number of boundaries. And the coupling constant lambda is equal to e to the minus s0. And um, it may be appropriate to make that comment now. So, so from this point of view, this coupling constant lambda would be if we were to, um, to be in the mood to treat this like a string theory world sheet, this would be what we call the string coupling. And it's just parameterized here by e to the minus s zero, okay? Um, very good, so um, CGN is then the integral over all hyperbolic metrics on surfaces of genus G with n boundaries. So um, people like to draw sort of diagrams where you have various, uh, numbers of boundaries, and you could have you know, an arbitrary number in here, and then you could put handles also, however many you want. Um, and so um, 
we have basically here we have our you know, S1, S2, etc., Sn. Okay. And for each boundary, um, in principle, you would have this sort of wiggly cutoff boundary shape here also to take into account. Okay, so um, now uh, there are two distinguished cases. I've already shown you one. Um, so before I write down the answer for, the, for this, the general answer, this general answer can be phrased in terms of only three ingredients. Um, one of the ingredients is this, okay, and in particular also this idea of integrating over the wiggly boundary. The other in the ingredient will be something that's related to um, the moduli space of genus G Riemann surfaces with N geodesic boundaries. And this is, this is really where Mirza Khani's work um, has been uh, extremely important. Um, and another, another geometry like this one, which is the only other distinguished one. So let me write this here. So we have, uh, there are two distinguished uh, configurations, let's say. Okay, so the first one we already said was the disk. And the disk has uh, Euler number one because it has one boundary. It has no genus, uh, and I start at two. So with Euler number one. And this guy I've already drawn. Um, um, you integrate over this with respect to the Schwarzian action. And what you actually find, uh -huh, so now it's something like one over beta to the three halves times e to the some number divided by beta, I think. Yeah. Um, and if you want, just uh, notation-wise, we might call this guy z 0, 1, simply because we have g is equal to 0 and n is equal to 1. But the other, uh, and this has positive Euler number. There is one more contribution that has positive Euler number, which has the topology of an annulus. So the second one is the topology of the annulus. But in this business, the annulus is called a trumpet. Um, and that's a, ge that's a geometry which has two boundaries. So therefore, it's an annulus. Genus zero, so it has Euler number zero. Okay, And I actually, uh, for this game, I need to consider one boundary to be uh, wiggly, and the other boundary will be geodesic, meaning that it has zero extrinsic curvature, and I fix its length to be L, just by definition of the notation. And okay, so why, do pe why did people call it the trumpet? Because, um, so I think this notation came from the SSS paper, because they like to draw it like this, where you have, you know, maybe this geodesic boundary here, and then um, the the other end of the trumpet, they drew much bigger, and you can imagine this, this might be a trumpet. But you know, it's topologically the same as this annulus with one wiggly boundary and one geodesic boundary. This guy uh, would be um, z0, 2. And also you can integrate against uh, the Schwarzian, um, and you find that this guy has uh, one over square root beta, times e to the some number divided by L, square root beta. Now, um, so then let me write the general answer for the general contribution, and then we will go back and we'll, we'll pick out the terms that are actually of interest for us for now. Okay, so I'm assembling sort of a number of ingredients um, and uh, well, we're, we're, we're slowly getting to where we want to be.
So in general, then, um, in general, you have then Z, G, N, and yes, actually, it's, it is good that I wrote it here because this is really the result of all these people together. Um, Z, G, N um, can be written as, so this is now the actual, uh, the actual answer for a geometry like this, where I have, if you want, N of these wiggly asymptotic boundaries. I have some um, genus that comes from you know, what I drew here, and the way that I, uh, that I assemble this is actually by using uh, trumpets for each of these asymptotic boundaries, and then gluing them to a um, Riemann surface of genus G, which has N geodesic boundaries, because those, those objects um, are, uh, in some sense, more uh, well-controlled. So I, I can write this then as an integral of d l i l i, one for each geodesic boundary. Okay, so each of these geodesic boundaries I integrate over its length, um, and um, I put one of these z oh, z trumpet. So um, also th this is this this is also sometimes called z trumpet. Um, so I take a Z trumpet, which has a functional form that I showed, but it also helps us to basically convert um, this Li into the beta I boundary condition that I fixed. Okay? And I integrate those guys into an object which is called VGN of L1 up to Ln, where the only object that I haven't yet defined uh, is this Vgn, and this is called a vial Peterson volume. Um, of the moduli space of Riemann surfaces of genus G with n geodesic boundaries. And these guys satisfy the so-called uh, Mirzakhani recursion. So the fact that we can actually compute these things, which are very interesting geometric objects and uh, also interesting objects, as it turns out, in two-dimensional quantum gravity, um, um, is thanks to a very ingenious recursion relation of Mirzakhani, which also, um, as I said, was developed and put into matrix model technology context by Ina and Oranta. Can I just ask one? Yes. Yeah. So your number of weekly boundaries is the same as the number of geodesic boundaries? Yes. I see. Is that uh, necessary? Uh, no, I don't think so. So um, I think you, you can choose different boundary conditions on the external boundaries. You could also, in principle, consider something like um, a Neumann boundary condition for an external boundary. Or you could even, I, I don't know if people have done that, but give some kind of geodesic boundary condition for the external boundary, and then those things would not necessarily match up. I see. So, but the general configuration that you are taking is a Riemann surface of genus G with certain number of weekly boundaries and certain number of geodesic boundaries, right? The, configuration, that... I, the configuration I want is the one which has asymptotic boundaries, which are wiggly boundaries. And the way that I constructed... Oh, all of them are wiggly boundaries. So the external boundaries, I'm choosing them all to be wiggly boundaries okay. because that's the canonical ensemble boundary condition that I want. Okay. But uh, if I think of this as a more general formalism that produces answers for geometries, I am free to specify other asymptotic boundary conditions. I see. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, just to add to this answer, so uh, in order to uh, construct this whole partition function, one can have some building blocks. So uh, for uh, each of the uh, weekly boundaries, as he drew that uh, one uh, can have a trumpet. And uh, to construct the general Riemann surface, so one can have a, uh, a generic pair of pants decomposition, and one can uh, cut uh, along uh, some circles. And for each pair of uh, pants, there would be three uh, geodesic boundaries uh, over which uh, it has to be integrated over. But that's a question of how you, uh, how, how you think about the Weil peterson volume, which I basically just uh, uh, put here. So indeed, if you wanted to develop this Mirzakhani recursion, 
then you would have to think about the different pair of pan decompositions of Riemann surfaces with only geodesic boundaries and genus G. All right, so, um, but uh, actually, uh, okay, it's nice that we can write down this general formula and it will be useful, but I want to now um, pull it back again and talk about some simple, uh, some simple examples that, that will um, make contact to this uh, spectral form factor story. And I should say, um, yeah, no, I, I will say that. Okay, that will come in natural. Very good. So, um, so then the JT spectral form factor. Okay. Um. So um, what we find is then that in, in pictures, Z of beta, right, that's equal to um, all of the geometries that have one wiggly boundary, by the way. So it will be this plus e to the minus S0, the thing with one handle, plus etc. Okay? But this Z01, the leading contribution, is precisely what we calculated. That's the disk with the wiggly boundary. Um, so um, that means then if we, if we take just this, so, so from this, from this alone, we would get the, uh, we would get the equivalent of the uh, answer that I argued happened in the three-dimensional case. So we would get something like z of beta 1, z of beta 2 would be a product where I have this times this, where that guy might have fixed boundary length beta 1 and this might have fixed boundary length beta 2. And of course I would have corrections where I multiply, for example, this guy with this guy or this guy with some other guy, but they are, um, they are suppressed in e to the minus s0, and they actually don't change the qualitative story that I want to say now. To have a qualitative change, we have to do um, something else. But first, let's, let's, let's say what this story is. Um, so then, um, if I now look at what is the answer for the disk that I had, then I find that f beta of t basically will be this z01 of beta plus i t, z01 of beta minus i t. And looking, uh, and I like to consider this just to see what it looks like at late time. I take t much bigger than beta 1, beta 2. If I look at what that, what that gives me, um, it gives me 1 over t from each of them, so 1 over t cubed. And this guy gives me the usual uh, beta over beta squared plus t squared. So that gives me the promised, that gives me the promised decay, which is one over t cubed, okay? And so that gives me the um, semi-classical part of the spectral form factor, if you want. And in particular, uh, we notice that this, we notice already that this is uh, in trouble with unitarity at late times. But actually, um, what, what really happens is that if you take this recipe, what you really should say is that it's this guy. So what really happens is that z of beta 1, z of beta 2, computed in JT according to the pattern goal that we just established, this has our contribution that we just talked about, plus e to the minus s0 times a geometry which has now two external wiggly boundaries and no genus. So g, z, 0, 2. And that thing can be calculated again with the ingredients um, that I showed here. Um, and what you find is we find that z0, 2 of beta 1, beta 2 is actually 1 over 2 pi times the square root of beta 1, beta 2, divided by beta 1 plus beta 2. 
And if I, again, expand this for late times, um, this guy now gives me some 1 over 2 pi times t, linear in t, over beta 1 plus beta 2. So this is uh, exactly the linear ramp contribution. Or in chaos terms, this is what we have called the spectral rigidity, or you know, it's, it, spectral rigidity is some sort of uh, uh, version of level repulsion because you see all the levels repel each other. So um, if I push on one, then all the levels will be pushed. So they tend to actually arrange themselves in a in a fairly regular pattern. And the fact that these quantum chaotic systems arrange their spectrum uh, in a fairly regular pattern. It can't be exactly regular, by the way, but fairly regular pattern. Um, that's what people like to call spectral rigidity and is behind this, this ramp behavior, actually. So this is what um, we have found here. So in other words, what we have managed to do is we have managed to um, cover two uh, epochs, if you want, of the spectral form factor. Um, we have calculated this decaying part, the E, uh, sorry, the 1 over T cubed. And now we have found that it um, gives way to, in fact, this linearizing ramp, as it should, as we have expected. Okay? But this linearizing ramp for now keeps going. So this is, this is like the Z. 0, 0,2 contribution, and this is, if you want, the semi-classical uh, semi -classical contribution. Okay, and um, so that's very nice, of course. That's, that's I think, a, a beautiful result. Um, so in other words, uh, there, is, there are configurations which we call Euclidean wormholes. So they are uh, connected contributions that um, 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 have the same number of boundaries as the product of two disconnected uh, uh, spacetimes here, and that sort of save the day, that sort of quantum fluctuate in at late times to at least go in the right direction. But the linear growth, as I already argued, is not all. Um, in fact, what we, what we were quite excited about asking about is this plateau. So that's what I want to talk about next. But I see that there already are questions. Yeah, so what you are calculating here presumably is not just the product. It's some kind of averaging going on, right? Because uh, if it was just a product, you couldn't have gotten the connected. Well, I didn't do any averaging. <laughs> you would have seen me do it. I didn't do some slide of <laughs> but, but no, no, but the question is, is uh, extremely good in the sense that what I have done is I have, um, I have looked at the JT path rule only. I haven't, I haven't done, if you want, a boundary computation. And the JT path integral, at least in the interpretation that, I, that what maybe is argued for by these people, tells you that there is this contribution here. Now, what you could say is that now if you go back to um, what does this mean from, from the boundary perspective, there it seems to imply some sort of average at this point. Yeah, because... You could have individually calculated z of beta 1 and z of beta 2, and you will not see this diagram at all, right? Yeah. yeah. But what I could have done is I could have calculated um, in an individual theory z of beta 1, z of beta 2, and then subjected to this um, quantum chaotic type uh, uh, analysis where I told you that I need to do some sort of effectively some averaging. Yeah. Uh, and one certainly viable interpretation is that what JT gravity at least is this level has access to is only that part of the computation. Yeah. But underlying it uh, is some microscopic theory. Okay. But those are very subtle questions which I think we should discuss um, either in the discussion session today or at the very end because they go right to the heart of some of the important conceptual implications here. But for the time being, I want to maybe push the technical development a, bit, a little bit further. Okay. Uh, well, probably I have not understood the notation, but uh, even in JT gravity, uh, I understood from that formula that uh, uh, zeta beta 1, beta n 
is obtained by taking n boundaries. Yeah. So this is in JT gravity. So z, uh, z of beta 1, uh, indeed, you wrote that formula, which is a sum over, over the genus. So I've not understood. The, it seems to me that this should be z of beta 1, comma beta 2. If you, if you, if you write z of beta 1, and, and you take oh, the no, product no, no, two. No, 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 I mean, I think we're just, we're just uh, arguing about notation here. So yeah. uh, what I'm saying is that the quantity z of beta 1, z of beta 2, evaluated in JT gravity, um, I interpret that to be the instruction to calculate all JT configurations which have two boundaries. Um, so what is the difference between z of beta 1, z of beta 2, and z of beta 1, comma uh, one beta 2? One of them is just a connected contribution, and the other one oh, is Oh, OK, I see. I see. OK. So let me, let me make a couple of uh, comments. So one is that, um, OK, so the interesting question that I would like to answer um, today still is, how do we uh, think about the plateau? But, but um, I want to point out something um, about the, uh, let's say, non-perturbative nature of this question. So, so the ramp. is an e to the minus s zero effect. That is uh, a non-perturbative effect from the point of view of this two-dimensional gravity. But of course, in the actually identification here, you see the coupling constant here, lambda, is just e to the minus s zero. So in some sense, I could translate this into a perturbative question. And again, if we compare this to the well sheet computations that that Ashok Sen is teaching us about, this would be sort of a perturbative expansion in the coupling constant. The plateau, on the other hand, so, so it's still, from the 2D quantum gravity point of view, it is still a non-perturbative effect, okay? Don't get me wrong. But the plateau is um, of the order e to the some phase times e to the s0, okay? And so, 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 okay, so people sometimes call this non-perturbative for the reasons that I just said. Then they would call this guy doubly non-perturbative. Okay, and to illustrate this just a little bit more, if we wanted to, to, to do a preview of what, what is done in higher dimensions, um, one, one um, morally good way to think about this is that let's think about the microscopic theory as something like SYK. Uh, SYK with n fermions has a Hilbert space dimension that is 2 to the n. So the entropy is n. So indeed, this guy is an e to the minus n type non-perturbative effect. So if you were to uh, think about some analogy in n equals to 4, these are like e to the minus n type effects. And those guys are e to the phase times e to the n effects. So again, doubly non-perturbative effects from that point of view. OK, now, um, right, maybe I don't want to go on a little too, too much with that. There is also something regarding this non-perturbative completion of <coughs> matrix models, et cetera, but maybe, maybe tomorrow. Um, OK, but notice maybe the last thing I should say is that this is kind of of the form e to the 1 over gs, although there is a phase here. So I'm not quite sure how to think of the phase uh, uh, from, from your perspective. But it's like e to the s0 is 1 over gs, OK? gs with what, OK, I call it lambda here. Very good. So um, so let me make some comments on higher dimensions, uh, just, just preview type comments. So the story here is, is uh, two-dimensional. Um, and it relied on the fact that there is a good e to the minus s expansion, which really comes back to the fact that the Einstein-Hilbert time gave us the Euler density, gave us the uh, 
Euler number, and we could arrange this thing in a nice topological expansion. That thing, that structure will not be at our disposal in higher dimensions, and it will be difficult to have a precise direct analogy. But um, in this current perspective, this delta, which goes like e to the minus entropy generally, um, is such a parameter. And in fact, this flavor nonlinear sigma model actually is an expansion, if you remember, in omega over delta. So it is an expansion in e to the, uh, e to, e to the um, well, here I'm, I'm calling it e to the s. Okay? So organizing things in terms of the inverse level spacing is some sort of analogy to this uh, genus expansion which carries up to higher dimensions. Um, uh, now, um, the question in higher dimensions that is equally subtle is also um, what about the, these wormholes? In high ID? And actually, there, you know, some candidates have already been written down many years ago by Maldasena and Maos. And more recently, many people have been thinking about it, but in particular also uh, Kotler and Jensen have uh, suggested that there may be some solutions which are not quite saddles, but they have, you have to put some, some uh, additional constraint, and you might call them constraint gravitational instantons. So that might be the right way to think about it. And finally, the question that already has been uh, uh, um, asked by Ashok is sort of this like factorization versus ensemble, um, which is even more of importance in higher dimensions, and why um, I will I think talk about tomorrow. But there are um, many ideas here, again um, coming from, for example, the Stanford group, but also by um, Andreas. Uh, and uh, Thomas Mertens and other collaborators. So the idea is, um, you know, indeed, how do you recover individual uh, quantum systems from this kind of description? And in high dimensions, that is actually a more pressing question um, for reasons that I will explain tomorrow. Okay, so let me now talk about the plateau. So that's indeed the last thing I want to cover today. Um, so, we've had, we've, so we've had some success now in understanding some of the ergodic physics of, of two-dimensional gravity, and so we, we have already established level repulsion, if you want. But what, what is um, an exciting prospect or, or an um, you know, something that we should really want to do is to actually also get to this plateau. And as I said, this plateau is particularly interesting because it's, it's, it's very much dependent on the discreteness. So it's sort of, if you get the plateau, then you have enough resolution in this theory to talk about individual microstates. So um, let's, let's do it. Okay, and so um, this, um, I'm using the perspective indeed, as I said earlier, that comes from work with Outland, um, with Post, Van der Heyden, um, and Eric Belinda. And um, so, um, what, what we want to learn how to define, so we want, need to learn to work with these spectral determinants, right? The, that E1 minus H, that E2 minus H, um, well, yeah, okay, yeah, any, any number if we really, um, okay, that E 
n minus h, and maybe it would have been good to give this as some prime one, so that I only have to write n of them, basically. Is that the notation I chose? No. Actually, I had, uh, okay, sorry. I called these guys x1 up to xn, and then these guys y1 up to yn. And we need to learn how to work with these in JT. So, um, so the, the, the approach that we chose to take is one which has been um, referred to, so people use the word um, of universe field theory in a sense that you want some theory that allows you to create these boundaries and to create an arbitrary number of them and then calculate correlations of them. Now, <clears throat> um, it, okay, this is, this is kind of like what Sakura was saying earlier. So if, if you think of this as a string world sheet theory, then this, this structure is actually a string field theory. But if you say string field theory, then most people leave the room. So I <laughs> refrain from saying it. Um, um, let's call it more evocatively universe field theory. Okay? So, um, so what we need to introduce is basically we need a gadget that is, we need something that is defined non-perturbatively. Um, it uh, can produce the JT genus expansion. Um, and it produces Uh, so this is in some sense when I expand it around a certain vacuum, expand it around or around uh, a certain standard saddle point. But it can also produce these e to the i alpha e to the s zero effects. Um, and in this case, I will expand around uh, some alternative saddle. or perhaps what is the most sort of smoking gun, um, um, smoking gun evidence or the smoking gun derivation is that I can actually use it to derive the nonlinear flavor, uh, the flavor nonlinear sigma model. Okay, so I can actually go back all the way from this theory which produces the JT genus expansion and I can use it to derive um, fully explicitly this flavor nonlinear sigma model uh, that, that I described. So am I out of time? Yes. Sorry? Am I out of time? No, no, I have a uh, question. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> yeah, much better. Um, yeah, so before going into this uh, description, yeah. Uh, so you told us how to compute uh, all these uh, partition functions, which are exact party integrals on the geometries, and one can list the geometries and, and sum them. So what prevents us to compute this plateau uh, in, the, in the original formulation? Yeah, so, so there is two answers to this. So one is that, first of all, it's an asymptotic series. And um, in some sense, the plateau uh, is a non-perturbative effect in this asymptotic series. So you can't directly compute it. But of course, you can um, try, and actually people have done this with success, um, to do some kind of a resurgence technique to this series. So this is, for example, some work that uh, Ricardo Schiappa and collaborators did. Moreover, however, after um, we calculated this using this uh, um, very nice, well, I think very nice non-perturbative structure. There were some beautiful papers. Actually, again, um, one of them um, Andreas is involved in, um, and another one is just by the Stanford group, um, which, which basically um, do some 
I understand it anyway, to be some resummation technique, again, on this expansion, working for a particular eigenvalue that is very close to the edge, and actually extract, again, the plateau uh, from, from, indeed, knowledge of this expansion. So it is possible. Um, yeah, uh, I think that having like the sort of fully non-perturbative structure here, and in particular the one that gives you the flavor nonlinear sigma model, and that also allows you to derive an action of this causal symmetry, then it allows you to see the full symmetry breaking pattern. To my to my mind, anyway, still is very nice to have because it really is a proof of this full quantum ergodicity of the of the system in a very explicit, very direct way. But um, indeed, there are. Uh, clever techniques where you don't need to go to this full universe field theory and you can still arrive at the plateau. Yeah. Yeah, so if you did use the language of string field theory, presumably these are D instanton effects, right? And in string yeah. field theory, understand why you should add D instantons. I mean, here it looks like you are adding an additional component of the world sheet with boundaries, right? And it's a little strange that you start with closed world sheet and suddenly it... Uh, yeah, I asked you that question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I mean, doesn't <laughs> I it sound a little... So yeah, are you going beyond what you originally started with, that it's not a really jetty gravity, but uh, jetty gravity with some additional yeah. completion? So in, well, what, what another way of saying it is that you add different boundary conditions. Yeah, and you sum over all of those. Yes, that, yes, yes. You add different boundary conditions, and uh, again, um, they are what is appropriate to study the theory in a microcanonical ensemble where you fix energies and don't fix the, the length of the boundary circle. So I would say again from, from um, the quantum chaos type mindset, this is very natural to do because those are exactly the spectral probes that we've calculated before and you only get them if you introduce those boundary conditions. But they do define some brains on which universes can end which um, you add to the theory. I, I, I mean, yes, I think I would really be interested in discussing that with anyone, of course, but it is true that if you're uh, somebody who really lives truly in this two-dimensional universe, and that's the question that we need to ask when we go to high RD, um, is there some absolutely completely intrinsic justification for adding these additional boundary conditions? Um, and I, I don't actually know the answer to it. But I think it is a very interesting question. Okay, so, um, right. I have, I guess, another so 15 minutes or so. So, um, yeah, I, I probably won't completely finish, but almost, and so we, there's still enough time tomorrow, I think, and to talk about higher dimensions. But I want to do a bit more than just talk about high dimensions tomorrow because I also want to sort of wrap up things uh, in a way that is very suggestive, really, that quantum chaos plays a very important role even in sort of the architecture of space-time. Um, but I think it can be, yeah, we can, we can do that. Okay, so, um, very good. So, um, I am only going to give a sketch. And so it starts by recalling that the spectral density of JT, we didn't actually compute it, but um, it follows from the disk one point function. This is actually the famous e to the s zero times the hyperbolic sine of two pi times the square root of the energy. And we take this as an input and we use it to define a spectral curve, which I call S, J, T. So now this S is the spectral curve. And that is a, an auxiliary equation which I call H of X and Y, um, such that I take Y squared minus, um, I think I have some practice of pi, okay, who cares really, but anyway. 1 over 4 pi squared times 
sine squared of 2 pi square root of x. And x is sort of like uh, minus e. So that's why this became a sine squared. Um, and so, okay, I am going to sort of say a bunch of words which are useful to those who know them and maybe also to those who want to look it up. Um, they give you a little bit more of the background where this machinery comes from, but I could actually just write down now an action for you, this is the theory, and then argue that it does what I want. But so the one thing that I wanted to say is, so actually this defines a Calabi-R threefold via an equation which is actually you have to have two more complex directions, u v minus h of x y is equal to zero. And the theory that one actually defines is a string theory whose target space is that Calabi R. Uh, and this string theory for us uh, basically is a theory of two-dimensional universes um, which are described by JT gravity in two dimensions. Okay, so technically speaking, so this has to do with, um, with uh, um, the, the, the target space of a Calabi R threefold of a topological B model string theory. But what we use is a slightly simpler version of this. We call it KS theory because the, the theory here is called Kodaira Spencer theory. And this is actually just the dimensional reduction of um, actual Kodaira Spencer theory, which lives on this Calabi-Yau, um, to the spectral curve of JT. And you see the spectral curve of JT is embedded in this Calabi via this equation. But uh, as I said, I can just write down the action. So the action is actually, um, oh, and uh, I think um, names associated with this are like Cecotti, Oguri, Wafa, Bershatsky, um, that kind of, uh, that kind of um, developments and those kind of authors. So it's, uh, d phi dj of e to the minus the action of this Kodaira Spencer theory, or KS, KS theory, plus uh, one will add some sources. Now, um, so where i ks, right, this is a two dimensional theory because I've reduced it to this spectral curve of jt has this, what will turn out to be a twisted Carl boson phi. Um, it has some J wedge D phi, plus it has a cubic interaction. And actually, um, very intuitively, this cubic interaction is basically the pair of fans, which allows you to construct all these Riemann surfaces. So, um, and phi is a twisted Carrel boson on SJT. Well, J is some current that I add. On shell, they are identified by the equation of motion. J is d phi. Um, and um, it, this cubic interaction depends on, on the co coupling constant lambda equal e to the minus s zero. Yeah. So is this the string field theory whose world sheet theory is jetty? Is that the yes. claim? I yes. See. That's exactly that's exactly the claim. Okay. But we're not saying it because then people leave the room. Okay. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah. Um, so what is important for us is that there is a translation to perturbative JT gravity. In particular, we can write everything that we wrote before, which is the Dirichlet version of the JT partition function, which de de depends on beta one to beta n. We can write this as um, 
some transformation of the uh, n point correlation function of this J field in this KS theory, where the measure is just e to the minus beta i z i squared for each of the insertions. Um, and um, dz i over 2 pi i, and I have to choose some contour for this uh, inverse Laplace transform. So the, the claim is, uh, and this, this, is, this can be shown, of course, that uh, so sh studying the correlation functions of this J in this Kodaira Spencer theory um, precisely gives you all of this, the, the exact answer that I had here before I erased it for the canonical partition function of ZJT or the connected contribution of the N partition function uh, 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 correlation. Okay, so however, um, yeah, I can go a little bit, but it allows more. So, so this is basically sort of, we touch base with what we have done before, but now what can we do? There actually exist operators in this theory, which um, we have argued, well, which are these determinants. So these operators basically you should think of the twisted Carroll boson D phi itself as sort of the spectral resolvent. And so you integrate it e to the phi is the insertion of the determinant. So, but also allows to compute uh, that type operators. And in particular, um, um, so um, particular for us, something like that x minus h is actually just the vertex operator e to the phi and the inverse determinant that y minus h is e to the minus phi. Okay, again, um, as, as you probably appreciate, of course, uh, for the um, you know, sake of time, I don't have the time to derive this completely. I will give our references and also those of other authors that are relevant um, on, the, on the web page. There is obviously you know, some development to make these arguments. I'm just sort of stating it as a fact. Okay? The, um, it's, it's a combination of you know, defining this theory, working with its, uh, itself non-perturbatively and recovering the appropriate JT answers in the appropriate perturbative limit. So for example, here, you might want to now try to recover precisely computations where you specify Neumann boundary conditions of sum on, on the boundaries. And again, um, it is possible. So these are like, um, Deep brain vertex operators. Yes. Yeah, this x and y are the same as those. Um. How many? No. Those? Sorry. So that's that's actually kind of bad notation. So I should have called them maybe z1 and z2. And this depends on z1 and this depends on z2. And you see, okay. because the spectral curve here, this is like a an equation uh, in x and y, and I will solve it for x, for example, and then the spectral curve will be a double, double sheeted cover of the complex plane, and that will be the target space of this theory. And so there, then z1 and z2 will de de refer to coordinates on that spectral curve. Okay, and this dead prime is what? Which oh, uh, no, no, it's that to the power box. minus one. Oh. So now, um, with this technology, um, one can show the following, and this is the key equation. The key equation is that the correlation function of e to the phi um, of x1, e to the minus phi 
of y1, and there has to be some normal ordering procedure. e to the phi of xn, e to the minus phi of yn, in this KS theory, can be written exactly by exact manipulations. Um, so we can call this maybe by definition z of x. This is one of these generating functionals where the axis now, again, is the graded vector that is made by the x1s up to the xn's in the fermions and the y1s, y1s to the y_n's in the bosons. And this guy can be written exactly um, as a integral over a graded n slash n matrix dA um, times e to the minus e to the s0 gamma of A um, plus e to the s0 times the super trace of x times A, where gamma of A um, well, take some form for JT gravity. Is, is the JT potential, if you want. We can call this the JT flavor potential. Um, I don't want to write it here. It just has some inverse trigonometric functions and so on. It's a, it's a relatively, uh, it's a relatively uh, simple expression. Um, but it's an explicit expression. And what is, what is interesting to note, um, for, for those who, uh, who know this, it behaves like A cubed for small a, which is precisely the way that the um, edge physics of JT or SYK, or if you want some sort of generalized area model behave. So it, it behaves uh, exactly the way you want, and there is some very explicit form of this. But um, maybe one more comment that can be made is that, for example, um, in the color space language, so the original way that SSS defined the JT matrix model, it's actually very awkward to write the potential. They, they never explicitly wrote the potential, but for good reason, because it's very awkward. In the flavor language, you can just write the potential, and it's not too bad uh, of an expression. Um, and so now, okay, we're just one step away. So now this is one, one step before we go to the flavor nonlinear signal model. So maybe um, just to, uh, for, as the final expression, let me write that this now you can analyze and it breaks the causal symmetry, okay? So this leads to uh, causal symmetry breaking. And in fact, it gives um, a it gives a um, sigma model which is of the type A3 um, e to the, and here I'm going to write down um, the action, e to the minus i rho of e, so the, the rho of e that I wrote there in the beginning, times the super trace of x times a. Um, and the target space is simply oh, n slash n is the generalization. I mean, so what, what I have done here also, I have taken the liberty to generalize to n insertions of determinants, n even, let's say. Um, and we, we just get the fully general, the general guy. So let's say n is even, okay? So this is indeed now the um, flavor nonlinear sigma model um, for two-dimensional quantum gravity. And for any part of the spectrum. So if you want, I'm of course, you know, with, um, with quite a bit of machinery, that I didn't have the time to go into detail, but this is um, a proof that two-dimensional quantum gravity is fully hard quantum chaotic, has a fully ergodic phase, and that we can rewrite um, uh, the full non-perturbative completion of JT in terms of this, uh, this, this proto-sigma model 
and then reduce it to the a supersymmetric sigma model for a particular symmetry class. So in view of time, I'll end here. I'll have some more comments on this tomorrow, and then we'll talk about higher dimensions. But I've already taken up enough of your time. Thank you. So questions? Uh, so can this A be thought of as uh, open strings living on D instantons, this matrix A, over which you are integrating at the end? Um, so I, I'm not sure about the D instanton. The answer is that that's maybe true, but uh, something we should d discuss in detail. But what I can tell you is that there is this, uh, this Calabi-Yau, and on this Calabi-Yau I can have compact and non-compact brains. And actually the different boundary conditions can be, uh, can be uh, understood as open strings uh, like open JT universes that end on one or the other of these brains. I mean, there are many of them, but one or the other types of these brains. Uh, so the best analogy that I have actually is one to Leoville, where the non-compact brains would be like FZZT brains, and the compact brains are like ZZ brains, and you can have mixed boundary conditions. And in fact, this is something which I, I found quite fun, is that I wrote very early on I wrote this psi a mu type thing. In this framework, those are just Chan pattern factors where the open string adds, ends on one or the other brain. And so the compact brains, the ZZ brains, would be the color space brains. And the non-compact brains, the FZZT brains, would be the flavor type brains. And the nonlinear flavor sigma model, if you want, is an effective action that we've, uh, that we've that we've derived for the non-compact brains. I see, but if there are no non-compact brains, there should be a, a special direction on which the matrices depend. So these are some kind of path integrals over matrices? Yeah, they're wrapped on some cycle in this Calabria. Okay, so then they're like the instantons, right? I mean, have the, 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 I mean the, I'm happy to they don't have extension in any of the non-compact directions. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah, okay. So then I'd call them the instantons. In, in, okay. Very good. Uh, so, um, I wanted to ask about this. Uh, Where are you, actually? I'm here. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, this, uh, you said this is a non-perturbative definition of JT. Is it unique? Um, I don't think so. But I haven't completely, uh, I haven't completely, uh, or we haven't completely resolved that issue. Yeah, I don't think it is, I unfortunately don't think it is unique, yeah. But like within your formalism, you can I think that it has to do, so, so I think that um, the different kind of completions that you could have, they actually, in, at some point in derivation, translate to different choices of contours. And what is true is that from, from if, if I just use my sort of chaos goggles, there is a particular contour that I need to choose. And that does give you a unique completion. But again, intrinsically, from the JT point of view, I don't think there is uniqueness. OK, so if there are no other urgent, Pavel? Is, this true? is it true that this Calabiao has infinite dimensional homology? Um, I, I, I could be true. I think you know this. Because it looks like the curve has infinite genus. Sure, so. this uh, it does have infinite gen genus bec because of this, uh, because of the the, the pools of this uh, zeros of this sign. So it does indeed have infinite genus. So yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah. Okay, and this is somehow okay. It is somehow okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so before the discussion, which we start uh, in 10 minutes, we can take maybe a 10 minutes break. Don't be too over time to come back. So just 10 minutes to stretch your leg and then uh, you will have the chance uh, to ask questions to the three lecturers of today. Okay, let's thank again uh, Julian.